you're not gonna say, I don't see color. And if you are corrected by, by a black person, it's not embarrassing. What's embarrassing is not learning from it. So we are mixing it up today. We're doing something a little bit different. We're actually going to be reading letters from white journalists. Well, oftentimes when black people speak out on their experiences, it can be seen as complaining or causing problems instead of being seen as a chance for others to really learn or listen to a very authentic reality many of us face. I mean, let's just be real about this. And this can be something that can be changed. In fact, a game changer is when a white ally steps in to say, no, 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 no. Hear what they have to say. Hear what they're talking about. What they're talking about is real. And that's exactly why in this episode, I want to bring in one of my own allies and friend, Megan Mitchell. She's an Emmy Award winning anchor and reporter in Cincinnati. In addition to her journalism work, she's known for taking a stand and fighting for LGBTQ rights in her community. And you know what? She is one heck of a woman. <laughs> Megan, I am so excited to have you here. Truly, like this. I've been looking forward to this episode for months. Yeah, it's funny because the second that you called me up to ask me to be on this, it is everything I think we need right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think white journalists specifically are looking for that resource that's specific to journalism, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot of the times you'll read White Fragility or you'll read these books or see these Instagram posts, but they're not specific to what goes on in a newsroom. Right. And right. out in the community. So I think it's super important. Well, that's what we're here to do today. Yes. This is what we're here to do. Okay, so you actually have the first letter. Yeah. These. This is by a white journalist. So go ahead and read that for us. All right. So this letter from a white journalist says that I find myself struggling to cover specifically the black community. I want to do it. I think it's incredibly important. But often I feel like I'm not seen as the best person to do it. I prepare for every story I do, but you wonder if people are going to be as receptive to it because it's coming from me. For you, what has helped you cover communities of color, specifically the black community? Absolutely. You know, at first I am gonna kind of go to my first experience in my first market. I was in North Dakota and um, the, the main minority community that we cover is Native American community. I think what was important was Minority reporting is different because a lot of the times there's a disproportionate amount of people who are getting covered on bad stories, right? Mm, yeah. um, crimes, uh, things that are going wrong in specific communities of color. Then there are the good things that are happening in those communities. So, you know, there is this great initiative to raise money for someone, and that's oftentimes being covered in a white community, in a privileged community. And so you're going into these communities saying, I have a responsibility to make sure that there is a fair and equal balance just as there is in privileged communities when you go into them, right? Something that we've gotten in from white journalists where, just like this letter, you know, we'll say we want to cover it, we, we want to do the story, but, you know, as she said, she feels like uh, people, viewers, are not going to be as receptive if it's me. But, but at the same time, I mean, as a journalist, this, this is our job. This is our job to cover every single community. Absolutely, and one thing I think is really interesting, this was said on a panel that I was on the other day, when I go out and pitch a story about the LGBTQ community, it's often that I'm seen as trying to advocate for that community mm -hmm. instead of try to you know, cover it as a, an unbiased journalist, right. right? Right. But when a straight person goes out and pitches that, I mean, they have to recognize that privilege it's not a bad thing. A lot of people, especially white people, are really, really scared of privilege. They're like, well, I don't have privilege. You know, I struggled with this or whatever. Privilege is a power that you have to help people who don't have it. To some of these journalists, like, they're, you know, oh, well, I don't want to get anything wrong. I mean, allow that to be a learning experience. Don't be scared of being wrong, right? right. Be, be encouraged by the fact that you are able to use the platform and the privilege that you have as a white person to share a story about people who are doing good in the community yeah. that they're in, yeah. you know? And that takes us to our second letter. Okay. I'm really interested in you reading this one. Absolutely, let's do it. All right, so this letter is from a reporter in the Midwest and it says, I love the place I work, the people I work with. 
Still, I can't help but wonder and worry about the way that some of my black colleagues are perceived and treated. I talk up my colleagues and their skills every chance I have with our managers in public and in private. It doesn't seem to make a difference. I can't help but wonder if racism and unconscious bias are at the root of this problem. It makes me frustrated and angry. I can only imagine how frustrated and angry my black colleagues must be. So this was interesting because I wanted to do a little bit of research after I got this letter, um, which just under 4% of news directors in local TV news are black. And in comparison, to kind of put this in the context for everyone, 82% are white. Now those numbers are for 2020 and that's according to the annual survey done by the Radio and Television and Digital Association. So basically even if you have more faces of color on TV, the people in charge of putting those faces of color on TV, the people in charge of the overall news product, the stories that are put out, how those stories are told, are overwhelmingly white. And what's that expectation to be able to speak up yeah. for other journalists of color in the newsroom? That's, that's so important, right? Yeah. Now, a year ago, this was exactly a year ago, it was last May, I remember that there was a story about um, an 18 year old woman who was white from a pretty privileged town mm -hmm. and she had been lost, she had gone missing. And the story and the narrative really seemed uh, you know, it kind of took the community by storm. You know, there was now this mission to find her. Yet the exact same day, there was a 13-year-old black girl mm -hmm. who had gone missing. And they were found, they were both missing for six days. But we didn't spend any time on that little black girl. Mm -hmm. Why was that? So I sent an email to my news director and I said, listen, you know, missing indigenous women was a really big problem when I was in North Dakota, but it didn't get that coverage because the community's narrative of what it means to be a missing indigenous woman wasn't something that they were willing to you know, engage in or fight mm -hmm. for, at least according to the management at my station. So it is super important that we recognize when we're doing headline coverage of this one girl, of this one woman, where is it for this community, mm -hmm. right? Where is it? And so as a white person, I was like, this is my chance to like make my management understand the discrepancy, right? What, what was that like for you? I mean, were you nervous in sending that email? Because I, I was. Like... I'm not a confrontational person. <laughs> and so I remember thinking, okay, this is gonna be, this is gonna be like a, an out of my comfort zone type of thing. Mm. And But I you felt it. like you had to do it. Yeah, I felt like I had to do it. And, and you know, come to see like a month later was when all of, of the, the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and stories started coming out. And so I remember feeling scared that month and then feeling, I hate to say it, more validated in the month, the month later only because I was like, oh yeah, that, that was okay. I should be doing, you know, I should be doing this. So we'll, we'll take a little bit of a turn here because uh, we've talked a lot about what happens inside the newsroom. Yeah but uh, there's quite a bit that we face even outside the newsroom that, that gets in here, and that's what this third letter is about. Go ahead All right. and read that. So this is a letter from a white meteorologist in a top 40 market, and they say, something I've noticed since working in a bigger city is the amount of rude and negative comments towards my black coworkers on social media, whether it's the way they dress, the way they wear their hair, or even how they talk. Some people on social media love to hide behind a, commu a computer and vent their frustrations. It amazes me with how much grace my friends at work handle this, but I can't imagine getting those messages or comments about myself. Do you see a difference between how viewers respond to you versus your black coworkers? Absolutely. There's, there's not a question. So let me just like take you back to this morning, right? I noticed that I had burned my hair in my curling iron. Mm -hmm. And I told you, I'm like, I'm not gonna be putting any heat on my hair, my hair today. That is a privilege that I have, that my hair doesn't look in any way that someone would say, mm. oh, that looks unkept, yeah. that looks a little messy. Yeah. My black colleagues do not get that. It's understanding that we are looking through everything on TV through a white lens. Mm. When black women do their hair, they're not doing it to a way that is natural to them. They're doing it in a way that emulates a white person's hair because that's what people see from from you know, behind their TV screen, right? Another deeper thing, which is, is probably not you know, top of everyone's mind, is that black women 
more so than white women, are fetishized. You have to understand that like when a black woman wears the same dress a white woman wears, they're seen as, as wearing it like too uh, slutty. Am I allowed to say yes. that? Yeah. Slutty, scandalous. Right. I mean, We're, I've, I've gotten absolutely every it's, comment in the book. And that's the thing is like it's unfair because this was a dress that anybody could put on, but because of the yeah. way that black women are perceived in our culture, it is it is seen as a totally different thing, and it's really, really yeah. a problem, problematic. It, it's funny you bring that up because it, I had this white dress, yeah. um, and it was um, it was from the loft, I think, which is a professional, like, yeah. professional <laughs> literally professional right? wear. Um, but it wasn't actually mine. It was um, it was a handy down from a white reporter at my first at for, my first market. She was getting rid of dresses, which, by the way, we totally do. We love everyone. We, we, there's we, like we, literally here, an entire Facebook it. group. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, she, she gives me this dress, um, and I loved it. And we were, we were the same size and um, and everything. And the first day I wore it. Oh, I've never. We got 12 emails, 12, for this dress on how inappropriate it was, how scandalous I looked, um, horrible. It, to the point where my news director calls me in, right? Um, he prints out a photo of me in the dress on TV. Yes, he says yes. And uh, he shows it to me and he says, well, you know, this is, just doesn't look good. And I go, well, this is actually not my dress. It's, it's one of your anchor's dresses. This is not, a, I'm sorry, I said reporter. She was an anchor. She, she had worn this dress multiple times, all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, well, let's just not wear that dress again. It took me, it took me a couple years to really understand that for yeah. myself. Absolutely. Because really at first, that. I mean, the amount of self-doubt and, yeah. and reflection that you're like, why me? Oh, I felt horrible that day. Oh, I went home crying. I felt horrible that mm -hmm. day. I, and I felt ugly. Yeah. But it's interesting because I, I, I want to I wanna actually read a portion of this article. Sure. So I was in grad school at the time. And uh, I went to cover a political rally um, with a white journalist. I mean, we didn't bring any cameras because we were students and we just had our notebooks and our phones. So we didn't get any media passes or anything. Um, but it was just me and her, and it was in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is not a very diverse area to begin with, just with the population. But, you know, we were journalists. It was our first big political rally. We were super excited. Um, and we decided to, afterwards, write about our experience for the Huffington Post, and we alternated voices in first person to describe what happened. So I, I want to read you just a portion of this. This is, this is what she wrote. Um, who, again, is a white journalist. Quote, go back to the back of the bus. I heard one of the Trump supporters yell not once but twice. Not until I heard those words, though, did I notice these people were looking at us differently, not just at Jasmine, but at me because I was with her. I mentioned the comment to her later. To my surprise, Jasmine didn't hear it. It was very impressive, really, her ability to drown out verbal attackers around her. As the anger built up around us, I tapped Jasmine on the shoulder and said we should move, move in the crowd backwards for safety. My heart's still pounding. I told Jasmine, I'm sorry. She put her arm around me and smiled. It's okay, it's expected. I don't know if it was shame or embarrassment that I felt knowing people were watching Jasmine more closely. I saw really for the first time this was her reality. She had been there before. So at this particular rally, um, at, I had a, a white teenager who came up behind me. I was taking notes in my journal, and she had kind of pushed me down from, the, from behind. And I, and I turn around to, to look at her. This teen says, you're not welcome here. And then her mom comes up. And I'm thinking, right, this is where I'm going to get an apology, right? I mean, she pushed me down. She told me I'm not welcome here. I mean, like, this is where it is. And her mom came up and said, no, you're not welcome here. And that's how the day started. <laughs> and, then, and then at the point where um, this white journalist was writing about it, um, we had start to, we started to get circled and uh, more yells and more screams. And there was a moment where they had realized she was with me and suddenly there was no difference between us. And that's what she's really talking about here. You know, I do recognize that like 
when she wrote that, there's a part of me that wondered the, in the exact same thought, if it was just you that had written that article, would people have been like, she's being dramatic? Mm. Complaining. Complaining. Right. How do we make more room for diverse voices in our newsroom? You know, there was a really interesting panel that I was a part of last, or I was watching last week, and it was all about unmuting yourselves. In that panel session, there was a question time, and there was a straight white guy, and he asked the question, which had been sitting with me like the rest of the day, and he said, I feel like I can't have my voice heard because I'm a straight white man, and you know, I feel like I'm not being heard. And I think it sat with me because, you know, Although there is a movement right now to have women in, in the office be heard, to have black women be heard, it doesn't mean that your voice is getting hidden, but it is a great opportunity to allow people to say, hey, you know, I, I have this thought in the newsroom, but I think Jasmine has an even bigger thought. So it's mm -hmm. as a white person, taking control of that conversation and then handing that off to someone who, who's trying to have their, their thought be heard as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that because I think the article or the portion that I read, I think it was stronger together yeah. than it would have been if we had just done two totally separate things. Yeah. It, it just totally opened the conversation. Absolutely. On how do we cover things? What's the best way to go about it? How should we protect ourselves next time? What do we need to watch wow. out for? And it, it just, it, it's, it really opens the door. Yeah. Which is exactly why I wanted to have you on. Yeah. Because I said this conversation, everyone needs to be a part of it. Yes. Whoa, wide open. I feel like biggest fear that is, I've seen in the last year is that I have white friends who will say, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And my biggest, my biggest thing I can, I can plead with them is, Say what you feel is right, and if you are corrected by a, by a black person, it's not embarrassing to get checked from something. It's not embarrassing to get called out. What's embarrassing is not learning from it. Megan, <laughs> I am so glad that you came on. <laughs> Me too. I really am. I think this is this is awesome and needed, and you know, just so necessary. And it means a lot from me. Um, from the bottom of my heart to just have you as, as an ally, as someone um, who's helping the cause. It really does mean something to me. I love you, girl. Love I you. really do. All right, y'all. Well, Megan Mitchell for you guys. And uh, like she said, like I said, we want everyone to be a part of this conversation. If you are a black journalist, we encourage you to go write a letter for us, write on everythingwecantsay.com. But if you're not, we still want to hear from you because your voice is still of value and we need you to be part of what we're trying to do here. So please do that. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this page. That's super important. And of course, don't forget to give us a follow on our Instagram at everything we can.